Good morning. Praise the Lord. Merry Christmas. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, I'm wondering. <laughs> you are here. <laughs> you can agree with me that many people are, are running back to the villages. Uh, if you've gone to town, you know how busy town is. Even the roads, there's lots of jam, yeah? Yesterday I was traveling with my wife back home and there was really a lot of jam. And, and we know that that is, that is happening because of the, what I would say maybe the vibe or the mood of the season that we are celebrating uh, the birth of a child and that is Jesus. We celebrate him every year that ends, every year, every year we celebrate him. And uh, surprisingly you'd see that um, you'd go to most of the workplaces, maybe supermarkets, saloons, hospitals. They've decorated. They have Christmas trees. We have them here as well. I was doing a bit of research and uh, I found out that uh, there is, uh, in 2010, they, they did some research and they were looking out for the most expensive Christmas tree. And that tree was found in Abu Dhabi in a hotel called the Emirates Palace. And they say that this Christmas tree was about 43 feet. When they say 43 feet, if you're not used to measurements, I'm about five and eight, five feet and eight inches. So five, if that is a tree, it had about eight, eight Elishas. So you can imagine a Christmas tree that is <laughs> 43 uh, feet. But also they say that it costed 11 US uh, million dollars. And converting that to Ugandan shillings is about 41 billions. So I was looking at that and wondering, how much would that buy? Uh, in 2022, uh, the government said they were going to uh, invest in a project of ferries for Uganda to be able to go to TZ, and it was costing 41 billion. Uh, and that was to buy two ferries, but in Abu Dhabi, they're investing that in a Christmas tree. But also, this is a country where Christianity is, uh, as of 2010, they were saying it is at 12.6%. And this is not only in Abu Dhabi, but in all the other countries that form the United Arab Emirates. So to say that they invest all that money in such a tree, not because they believe Jesus, but somehow that's how they understand. Uh, and so we know that many have misunderstood the birth of this child. And so today I want us to look at who is this child that is born to us? That is the question I want us to address. Let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for bringing us together as a family, as uh, also we look to celebrate the birth of your child, Jesus. I pray that this will go well, but even that you speak to us in your word, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And so from... Uh, for us, uh, I want us to take our reading from Matthew, chapter 1, verses 1 to 6, and then I'll read verse 16, and then I'll read verse 21 to 23. Matthew, chapter 1, verse 1 to 6. It's what the Bible says. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah, and his brothers, and Judah the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar, and Perez the father of Hezron, and Hezron the father of Ram, and Ram the father of Aminadab, and Aminadab the father of Nahashon, and Nahashon the father of Salmon, and Salmon the father of Boaz by Rehab, and Boaz the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of David the king, and David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah. And in verse 16, and Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called Christ. And in verse 21, she will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord has spoken by, had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. 
There are really a couple of names from verse 1 to verse 17. You could be wondering, what are we going to get from all these names? This one, uh, you know, the father of this, the father of this. But I believe there's something we can learn from this. And so as I said, we are looking at the theme, who is this child that is born to us? And from this, I want us to look at two points. And the first of them all is that this child that is born to us is king and God. But also secondly, that this child who is born to us is king of grace. Two things. He is king and God, but also he is king of grace. First of all, when I say that he is king and God, when? Where do I, do I get that? How can I prove that is this child that we are celebrating, Jesus Christ, is King and God? We see that the writer of the gospel according to Matthew is Matthew, and the audience to whom he's writing were Jews. But as he's writing, his intention of writing, he wants to tell the Jews that actually this Jesus that you crucified is King of the Jews, he's King of Kings. And so that's why he begins with the genealogy. And when he begins it, he's saying that the genealogy of the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, because David was a king. But also he proceeds and says that they're saying Abraham, he talks about Isaac, he talks about Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons, but he pulls out Judah. Because you read in Genesis 49, verse 10, uh, that whole chapter of 49 of Genesis, Jacob is blessing his children. When he comes to Judah, he says that the scepter shall not depart from you, the ruler's staff. So when he blessed Judah, he said that from Judah were to come the kings that would rule the Jews. And so that's why when he's doing this genealogy, he follows it through Judah, he goes to David. But even as he goes to David, he says that the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ most of the times we think Christ is Jesus' other name. But actually, his personal name is Jesus, but Christ is a title that was given to him. Some would say Jesus the Messiah, because Christ is God from Greek for Christos, and Messiah God from Hebrew. And the meaning is the title given to Jesus to say he is the anointed one. Now, when they say he's the anointed one, what do they mean? Because as the Jews, they used to anoint kings and priests and prophets. The anointing, they would pour oil on them because this was a sign, an outward sign, that they have been given the Holy Spirit to perform the role God has given them. And so as they poured oil on them, they anointed them, they were setting them apart from the rest of, of the other people of Israel. And so at this point when they're saying that Jesus is the anointed one, they're saying that He's the anointed one, the anointed king that was waited, that they were awaiting. Second Samuel, second, uh, uh, I mean, let's check out Second Samuel, chapter 7, verses 12. It says, when your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up uh, your offspring after you, who shall come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. And then verse 16, he says, and your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. So when they're talking about a throne to be established forever, this is Nathan speaking to David. This is a prophecy of the coming Messiah, the anointed king, the one whose kingdom would reign forever. So we are saying that this Jesus the child who is born is king. How is he king? The genealogy proves that he's king. But also the title that is given, the anointed one. You see, in where we are living today, you would hear people say, I want to search for anointing. I'm looking for more anointing. But I want to tell you that this they did because not every one of the Israelites was given the Holy Spirit. It was given to those who are doing certain roles of the Lord. But today in Jesus Christ, all of us, when you believe, you are given the Holy Spirit as a seal, Ephesians 1.13. You are given the Holy Spirit as a counselor, as a helper. So that means that you don't need any other anointing because you've been anointed by the Holy Spirit. That you don't need to pour oil on you because you have the inward occurrence has already happened. You have the Holy Spirit. So for those who search for anointing, you have the Holy Spirit. That's why he says in 1 John chapter 2, verse 20, that we have been anointed by the Lord. 
He has anointed us. He says in verse 27, we have an anointing, but you have an anointing from the Holy One. This is John speaking to the believers. So you have an anointing. In Jesus, all of us have been anointed. And so we are saying that Jesus is king because of the genealogy, because of the title. He is anointed. But also, we are saying that he is God, king and God. Why do I say he's king and God? Because verse 23 says, Behold, the, child, the, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. This is a fulfillment of a prophecy in Isaiah 7:14. So it's not only a name that this Jesus is God with us, Emmanuel, but he's actually God. John chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was? The word was God. And then verse 14 says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen the glory of the one and only son from the father who has come with truth and grace. So when they talk about the word being God, and then verse 14 they say he became flesh, they actually say that Jesus is God. He says in John chapter 8 verse 58 that truly, truly I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. That is Jesus speaking. So he has been, he is king and God. And so after understanding that this child we are celebrating is king and God, what should be my response? What should be your response? We see that in chapter 2, the wise men trek from far east and they come to worship this king who was born. They brought gifts. They bowed down and they worshipped this child because they knew that he was king and God. Wise as they were, they came and worshipped him. We see in Luke chapter 2, angels, they're saying a company of angels, they glorify the Lord. We are told that they tell the shepherds and the shepherds leave their sheep and they run to witness for themselves. And as they were coming back, Luke says that they were glorifying and praising God for what they had seen. So after understanding that this child is king and God, our role is to worship him, to glorify him, to praise him. Yes, I could buy new clothes. This shirt is not new, by the way, but a bit new. But you could buy yourself a new shirt, yeah? But above all things, remember that we are called to worship and praise this child who is born because he's king and God. However, we see on the other side, for some, it is a discomfort. In the same chapter, chapter 2, when the wise men came, they come to the palace, and Herod the Great hears that there is a king who is born. For him, that brought discomfort. He's thinking, eh, someone is going to encroach on my throne. So what does he do? He tells them, you go, when you find him, tell me I'll come and worship him. But that wasn't the intention. He kills all children below two years, because for him it was a discomfort to know that there is someone called king. And even us, sometimes we don't want to recognize him as king and God in our lives. We have other thrones. We have other kingdoms in us. But in this season, I pray that you will put down all those thrones and kingdoms and worship, glorify, and praise Jesus, who is king and God. We also see that when, when this happens, uh, verse, verse, verse 4 of chapter 2, we are told that Herod assembles the chief priests and the scribes. He asks them about this. And they say, ah, oh, it is written. They quote even a passage in, in Micah chapter 3 verse 2. And they are saying that it is written by the prophet. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. These people knew that someone was coming, a king was coming. But did they worship him? They ignored, even when they knew. We know that the chief priests and the scribes never worshipped him. They saw Jesus as their rival. But also the disciples, they misunderstood it. Acts chapter 1 verse 6, when Jesus Christ has resurrected, they're asking him and saying, are you going to now restore the kingdom back to us, the kingdom of Israel? For them, they thought he has come to restore a physical kingdom. And so many misunderstand this child who is born to us, who is king and God. Many think it is a time to make more money. Many think it's a time to be happy. 
Well, before we came to church, there was a song playing on TV, and they were saying, Christmas is the time to be happy. Yes, it's the time to be happy, but I don't know whether you've gotten the message clearly of what this Christmas is, the child who is born. He is king and God. And so our role is to praise him, is to worship him and glorify him. Like the wise men, like the angels, like the shepherds, they bowed and worshipped this king and God. Secondly, we said that this child is king of grace. What do I mean when I say that he is king of grace? As he begins the genealogy, he says, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. If you've read your Old Testament well, you would wonder, why would they make a list and they're beginning with David of all people? Second Samuel chapter 11, chapter 12, we are told that this man, everyone else has gone to the, to the fields to fight. Bona is in his upper room. He's chilling, yeah? As he's chilling, he sees there is a lady beautiful. <laughs> he says, you, know, you go and call that lady for me. I don't think he called the lady to have a cup of tea with her. We know what happened, yeah? And afterwards, to cover up his sin, we are told that in chapter 12, he plots for the death of the husband of this lady, Uriah. He's a murderer, he's an adulterer, but he's included in the genealogy, in the family lineage of Jesus Christ, the savior of the world. Can you imagine? That is all showing us that this is the king of grace. They talk about Abraham, and we know that Abraham was not perfect as well. When there is hunger, there's famine in, in Canaan where he was staying, he goes to Egypt with the wife, and he says, my wife, you know what? You are so beautiful. When they see you, they might kill me to take you. But just tell them that you're what? You're my sister. And we know how things played out for him. At some point, he does not even take on the promise of God. He goes ahead and lies with, with Hagar to have Ishmael. But God is a king of grace, includes him in such a genealogy. I could describe every name that is listed here, and you know that all these people are not perfect. But also we see there are five women listed in this genealogy. The Jews never listed women in genealogies. Genealogies were very important for them because they helped them tell which tribe you come from. When they were taken to captivity in Babylon and they came back, telling your genealogy would help you know which land you'd occupy. If you came from the tribe of Levi, it helped you to know whether you could serve in the temple. So it was very important. And they never put women, but we are seeing five women. And these five women are also women of laws. We see they talk about Tamar. Tamar, we remember the story in Genesis 38. He's a, a daughter-in-law of Judah. The, the two sons of Judah die. And the young one, Shela, he says, you know what? You have to go to your home because he's too young. When he grows up, I'll call you. The young man grows and they never call her back. So Tamar looked for ways and pretended to be a prostitute. So Judah comes and buys her. And then he doesn't have money to pay. I don't know how his planning was. It wasn't a good plan, isn't it? But he says, I'll come back and pay. He says, you leave me your signet ring and your walking rod or your staff. So when he leaves them, the lady disappeared. Then afterwards, they hear news that the lady was pregnant. And Judah was like, uh -huh, we have to get this lady. How could she do such a thing? She sends the staff and the ring and says, the person who owns these things is responsible. And Judah is like, you are more righteous than I am. But we see such a lady who is doing what we'd call a dad hurry, pretending to be a prostitute, included in such a genealogy. The next one they talk about is, is Ruth. And we know that Ruth was a Moabite. He was not a Jew. He's included because it pictures how the gospel was going to open up to the Gentiles. Paul says in Romans 1.16, I'm not afraid of the gospel for it's the power of God for salvation, first for the Jews and then to the Gentiles. This was picturing what God was going to do. We see Rahab included as well, who is a prostitute. But in the family lineage, we see they talk about Bathsheba, who we know also committed adultery with David. We see they include Mary in verse 16, who is a humble lady, a lady we don't know about, but is chosen to be the mother of our Lord Jesus Christ. And all of these people show you how Jesus is the king of grace. 
you also look back and see how your life has been. It could even be looking back as early as yesterday. But God has not struck you dead because he's the God of grace. You look back even at your thoughts, you could look at your thoughts and see. But God is the God of grace that he has given us salvation. And so fascinating about this genealogy is that we see all these men are men of flaws, but Jesus Christ alone is the only one who is sinless. He says in 2 Corinthians 5.21, you made him who had no sin to be seen so that he might become the righteousness of God. Jesus Christ had no sin, but was seen as one who has sinned, so that we might be the righteousness of God. He's the only one here who does not have sin. And what does that mean? It means that he's a rightful candidate for our salvation. If he had no sin, then he was able to save us, sinful mankind. But also what we see about this genealogy is that when we come to Jesus, it ends. They don't tell us about any other people after Jesus. Why is that so? Because Jesus closes it all. And that means that John 1.12 comes and makes sense that as many as believed and accepted him, he gave a right to become children of God. So when you believe and accept Jesus, you can also add your name in the genealogy there. You could say Jesus, eh? and then thereafter, Mr. Warakira, Gabit, eh? Gloria, Suma, you add there, you add there, because in Jesus, we are also counted under this genealogy. But also what it means is that if generational curses would be applicable, Jesus would be, the, would be the worst, I would say. Because in his genealogy, he has a murderer, he has an adulterer, he has liars, he has prostitutes, he has all kinds of people. But they never apply to him because he says in Galatians chapter 2, verse 13, that he became a curse for us when he was... He says that Galatians chapter 2, verse 13, chapter 3, chapter 3, verse 13, he says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, curses everyone who is hung on a tree. So Jesus broke the curse. That means that if you are in Jesus Christ, those generational curses don't apply to you. That when they are tracking back and they are saying, who are you, what is your name? I am Tumusime Elisha a son of Jesus Christ, a son of the Father in heaven. I won't say I am G Elisha Tumusime, the son of Joseph Rukando, and Joseph Rukando, the father of Michael. Uh, I've forgotten the name of my... Eh? Tuabwenechi. Eh? I won't say that because I know that I have a new genealogy in Jesus Christ, that he breaks it. So if you are in Jesus, the generational curses don't apply to you. Because he became a curse for us and he broke those curses. So as we celebrate this child who is born for us, we are called to remember that he is king and God. We are called to remember that he is king of grace. So as you run up and down, as you enjoy this season, remember that he is king and God. He is king of grace. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning, we thank you, Lord, for this season as we celebrate a child who is born. Reminded that this child is king and God. Reminded that this child is king of grace. I pray that these truths will be kept at heart as we celebrate this season. And if there is anyone here who has not experienced your grace, I pray that they will respond to it and believe you as Lord and Savior. And so that they will be able to experience the grace that you give us. Thank you, Jesus. We pray all this through the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.